Okay, so here we go. Uh, it is Tuesday, the 20th of May, and we are going to be beginning uh, or continuing our conversation on uh, the neuron and on action potentials and refractory period, and then we're going to move on and figure out how it is that an action potential does all the cool things that it does. Any questions from the beginning of Chapter 12? Structures of the neuron and this thing called an action potential versus a local potential. They may want to try to articulate what they understand to be a local potential. Anybody? What's a local potential? Say it again. Okay. So something that happens in that specific area. We're talking about a neuron, right? And something excites the neuron. Now, when the excitation occurs, what occurs at the membrane of the neuron? Sodium channels open. Okay. Now, where can this occur? Where can a local potential be initiated? Dendrites or soma. And even way down at the axon terminals where there aren't any Schwann cells, but we're not going to worry about that one right yet. Okay. But I want you to think about dendrites and somas right now. And a local potential, tell me some of the characteristics of a local potential. Graded. They are graded, which means they can be weak or strong. They can die out. They can die out. They're decremental. They are reversible, right? And they can be excitatory or inhibitory. Okay, they can be excitatory or inhibitory versus an action potential. Are we making sense of this yet? An action potential is what? First of all, where does an action potential get initiated? At the axon hillock. That's sort of the structural name. Functionally, what would we say is within the axon hillock? The trigger zone, right? So the axon hillock is sort of the physical shape of that area. And within the axon hillock region, there is the area called the trigger zone. And what is it about the trigger zone? What is the trigger zone doing? It's, it's able to initiate an action potential. Now, why is the axon hillock, why is the trigger zone uniquely able to initiate a large influx of sodium channels? Because there are more of those sodium gates there, aren't there? Okay, so there's a high density of these sodium channels, these sodium gates. Now, I'm going to add another word to that. They are sodium gates. They are voltage-gated sodium channels. And what that means is that that sodium channel opens in response to a voltage or electrical signal. Okay? So at the axon hillock, there's a large number of these voltage-gated sodium channels. And then what happens? An action, an action potential is different from a local potential in that an action potential, and you fill in the blank, not is not reversible. It is all or none, not graded, right? There isn't a stronger or weaker action potential. They're all exactly the same. And in fact, what is that similarity? The resting membrane potential of an axon is at and always is at negative 70 millivolts. If there's enough of an electrical disturbance within the axon hillock region, within the trigger zone, and that disturbance reaches up to a negative 55, which we call the threshold, then an action potential is fired. All or none, it's got to happen. That action potential, upward swing. What's opening? Sodium channels. And we call that upward swing depolarizing. And it will reach all the way up to a maximum of positive, positive 35. And then the curve will come back down. That coming back down is called the repolarization or the repolarizing event. And what's causing that to occur? Potassium, Potassium gates. Remember, the inside of the cell is more negative, negative than the outside. And so 
as the sodium gates open up way back at the beginning of the action potential. The sodium gates, sodium is normally found in higher concentration where? Outside, Outside the cell. So when the sodium gates open, that sodium comes rushing in, causing the inside of the cell to become less negative or more positive. That's that depolarizing upward swing. Then those sodium gates close, and now a little bit later, the potassium gates open. Now we know that potassium is normally found inside the cell, so when those potassium gates open, they are going to allow potassium to leave. Now that's going to drive, it's going to take negative charges out of the inside, isn't it? So as a result, the inside of the cell will once again become more negative or be repolarized. And then that repolarizing event will always kind of overshoot and it will go down below negative 70, down to around negative 72, 73, and that overshoot is referred to as the hyperpolarizing. You might see the word after potential in some verbiage. And then that after potential or the hyperpolarizing event returns back to resting membrane potential at negative 70. When the neuron is actively opening and closing sodium and potassium gates, we say that the neuron is in that area in its absolute refractory period. Whereas a little bit later, once the sodium and potassium gates have done their opening and closing, even though it may be a little harder to, to um, cause another action potential, now you're in a relative refractory period. That's kind of a quick verbal review of what we've been discussing. Now, you do have um, a chance to practice a lot of this information on Connect. If what I'm saying to you right now is making great sense to you, fantastic. If what I'm saying to you is like, oh, I still don't have this story down, that's okay. You're going to go to Chapter 12 of your Connect assignments, and you're going to work through that material. Believe today your second lecture quiz also goes open. It may have already happened. It may be a little bit later. But there's going to be three lecture quizzes that you will do before the first lecture exam. Now, that first lecture exam is still a ways away. It's on Tuesday, June 3. Still a way away. First lecture exam, June 3rd. Right? Monday, or Tuesday, June 3rd. Your lecture quizzes won't be due until Sunday, the 1st of June. There will be three of them. One has been open since the first day or so. That was on water balance. The second quiz, I believe, opens today. It's going to be on action potentials. The third quiz will open up later on. It may open tonight as well. I, I don't recall. Those quizzes are open book, open resource, non-timed quizzes. The idea is that you do the connect assignments first, interact with the material, make sure you understand it pretty well. Then go to the quiz. You can come and go, leave, come back, change answers, do all of that until the due date, at which time you will either submit it manually or it will automatically submit for you. That's going to be Sunday night, the 1st. And then a minute after the due date, the quizzes will become available for you to review. So like at 12.01 a.m. on Monday morning, the 2nd, you'll be able to review those quizzes. And you'll have all day Monday and then Tuesday up until the time of the exam to review your quizzes. What went well? What did not go well? Learn from your mistakes. Make sure you got it all fixed so that when you take the lecture exam, you don't repeat the same sorts of errors. Okay? So that's the progression. Now, there's also on Blackboard a series of files called your guided readings. And they will help you also as you're opening up your salad and textbook and trying to work through this material, what's important, what isn't important. I assure you right now, though, if I have not directly discussed it, it will not be on the exam. That's my usual mantra from 105. Now, there are always maybe a couple of questions where I expect you to kind of connect the dots, something I didn't directly say, but you should be able to figure out. But for the most part, if I haven't discussed it, I won't have it on the exam. That also has to go with the guided readings. If there's a question on there, I made those up in advance. If there's a question on there that I have not at all discussed, don't feel obligated to go spend hours researching it. It won't be on the exam. Okay, so only if I have directly discussed it will it be on your exam, okay? Questions about logistical things, how to approach this? I mean, we're still a couple of ways a week, a couple of weeks away from an exam, but I've got some people already telling me they're a little bit nervous, right? They're feeling a little anxious about how to prepare for this. So connect assignments, 
then quiz, and also those guided readings will help you uh, figure through some of these concepts. What is the Learn Smart? And that's in Pavlov. The Learn Smart, very good. The Learn Smart are those flashcard type modules. Uh, the nice thing about the Learn Smart, it's, it's a smart stack, a stack of deck of uh, cards. Let me say that again. It's a smart deck of cards, flashcards. And if you know it, you won't see it again. And if you don't know it, it'll keep reminding you of it. And if after a couple of times you sit on get it, it'll say, hey, guy, go to Saladin page, whatever, and it will bring you right to that section of the textbook through the ebook on Connect. So it's a really nice program, but it does take time. Right, those learn smarts are a little bit slow. So it's up to you. If you feel like you need one more level of practice, that's a great place to go. Okay. Now the first priority though you have is not going to be the lecture exam, it's going to be the lab exam. The first lab exam will be next Tuesday or Thursday, depending upon your lab section, and that's where most of you are going to be turning your attention right now. The good news is though, the first exam in lecture covers nervous system and your first lab exam covers also a large part of the nervous system. So you're actually, as you're studying for the lab exam, you're actually ultimately getting prepared for sections of the lecture exam as well. Okay, I think that's all of my commercials for the moment. Are the YouTube videos working okay? Um, I'm seeing a lot of hits on them, so I'm, I assume you're getting on there. I haven't gotten any emails saying there's been any issue. Every day, as soon as I finish the presentation and it downloads here and then uploads to YouTube, I will go on and give you the link to the YouTube video. So just be looking for those building throughout the semester. Go to, web, go to the uh, Blackboard site, it says YouTube lecture links, click there, copy and paste that URL address, and go to your browser and you'll be in YouTube watching uh, the whole presentation. Say that again for me. I'm recording right now. The first week. The first week, they weren't there. The first week, I was having some problems. This wasn't going yet. So the first week, I was going home and redoing the lectures, OK? But since then, last Thursday and today, and from this point on, as long as there's no technological issues, I'm recording right now this very lecture, OK? OK, so where did we get? We got in this uh, quite a ways, didn't we? So I'm just going to flash through some slides. As a reminder, we talked about the structures of the neuron. And then we discussed um, the, the, the movement of molecules up and down the axon. We talked about the importance of myelin, uh, the oligodendrocytes versus the um, Schwann cells, a couple of diseases where myelin is the culprit. Talked about the signal, how fast uh, action potentials and signals can go up and down neurons. And then we just really got into this whole idea of the resting membrane potential and the sodium gates and the potassium gates, getting us set up for this conversation about the action potential. Remember that in addition to, in addition to the sodium gates and the potassium gates that we're talking about when it comes to an action potential, that there's another set of sodium potassium gates related to the active transporter of the sodium potassium pump. Remember, that's happening in the background of all this. And that sodium potassium pump is doing what? Helping to maintain the resting membrane potential at negative 70. All right, so you've got to have that sodium potassium pump going in the background, keeping the sodium and the potassium where they need to be for all this to happen. And then we're talking about sodium and potassium gates that are separate from that. Question? Um, I'm going to that well, calcium? Yes, we haven't gotten to calcium yet. Give me a moment. We're going to get down to the synaptic knob and talking about the neurotransmitters. So we haven't quite gotten there yet. We will in a few minutes. So nothing about calcium yet. Everything so far has been sodium and potassium, hasn't it? We talked about local potentials versus action potentials. And in lab tonight and on Thursday, I'll be comparing action potentials with the compound action potentials that you learned about in Phil's 10. So as you were doing the fills exercise number 10, you weren't dealing with an action potential as we're describing it here. You were dealing with the collective action potentials, plural, going down a nerve. And all of those action potentials together are called a compound action potential. So a little bit of a difference. 
of what you were learning about in Phil's 10 versus the individual action potential that we're describing here that's going along a single neuron. So there is a difference there, and I'll clarify that for you in lab this week. Come on. There we go. Now, you've got to know this curve. This graph, right, this, this, uh, the numbers on here are critical. So again, make sure you have in your memory banks negative 70 millivolts. That's the resting membrane potential. That would be this straight line going across the bottom. Then number one, what's going on with number one? Let's break this down. Number one would be what? It would be the culmination of local potentials, right? The neuron has been disturbed somewhere in the dendrites, somewhere in the soma, and that signal is propagating toward the trigger zone. Those signals could be strong or weak. Those signals could get reversed. Those signals could and do degrade as they move toward the soma and move toward the ax uh, axon uh, hillock. And if enough of those disturbances reach the trigger zone, such that we go from a negative 70 up to a negative 55, and we reach threshold, then number two, right? We've reached threshold. And at that point, there's a massive number of sodium gates that open. Those gates would be called voltage-gated sodium channels because they open in response to a voltage change. And then there's this massive upflux, right, this depolarizing event, number three. The sodium gates open, they close when the cell gets to about zero. But there's always an overshoot, and that overshoot brings us all the way up to positive 35. That's where the curve now goes downward, and now we're at a repolarizing event. As we discussed, this is now the opening of potassium gates. They just open a little bit s slower. So the sodium gates opened quickly. They took care of business. And then the potassium gates are just a little bit slower to respond. And now as we come down, we're repolarizing. We always overshoot in this hyperpolarizing region and then return to resting membrane potential. If I were to draw a box right here, you're going to say to me, oh, during that time, the cell is in what? Refractory. Absolute refractory period. And then if I were to draw a box over on this side, while I'm down here below negative 70, that is the period that we call the relative refractory period. And what's the deal there? In the absolute refractory period, under no circumstances, under absolutely no circumstances, could you cause another action potential to occur. However, in the refractory period, you could cause, or in the, in the relative refractory period, you could cause another action potential to occur, but it would, cause, it would require what? More, right? It would require more stimulation because you would have to not only overcome the negative 70 up to the negative 55, you have to start from even lower, right? So it, it would take more of a stimulation, but it's not impossible. It's more difficult. That's the relative refractory period. Question. When you're repolarizing, those potassium gates are open and those also voltage? They are. Those are voltage gated channels and they respond in the same way. They responded to the signal coming down to the axon hillock, to the trigger zone, but they open, they're more delayed in their opening. So the sodium gates open immediately, the potassium gates are slim, simply slower to respond. In essence, they take turns. Right, the sodium's open and then the potassium's open, but yes, they're all voltage-gated channels. So the, the terminology here, I know it's a lot of syllables, right? Voltage-gated, mechano-gated channels. The word up front tells you what, it, what causes it to open. So a voltage-gated sodium channel would be a sodium channel that opens in response to a voltage change. If I said it was a mechanical sodium gated, or a mechanically gated sodium channel. Then it's going to be a sodium channel that opens up in response to not voltage change, but to some sort of mechanical stress or touch. Yeah. And that brings us right about where we were, right? 
the two different refractory periods, the absolute period that you see here in the orange. Again, whenever you think about, okay, during this box, the sodium, the potassium gates are opening and closing, aren't they? And you cannot, remember, this is an all or none phenomenon. So when those sodium gates are opening and closing, you don't have the opportunity, no matter what you do, you can't stop it from happening. So you absolutely cannot cause another action potential in that area of the axon. Whereas in the yellow area, there's your relative period of refraction. So sodium almost immediately. Almost immediately. Yep. Slower. slower to open and slower to close. Yep. Now, this is what I was trying to get us to understand. And I think this is a difficult concept. But up here it tells us that the refractory period refers only to a small patch of the neuron's membrane at one time. And Josh, that's what you were getting at. You asked me last time, is the entire neuron unable to fire another action potential? And the answer is no. It's only in that very small localized area where the sodium and the potassium gates are opening and closing where this refractory period is occurring. And, and I have some more pictures coming up, and I hope that that will make more sense to you as we go through this. The signal can only be sent down. Hold on to that thought. That whole idea of, of signals coming in on different dendrites, we're going to get to in a minute. Okay, hold on to that. Um, but other parts of the neuron can be stimulated while a small part of it is in refractory. Okay, so this is a localized problem for the axon. Okay, now we're going to come back and talk about that, but what, what's the whole deal here? We've got an action potential that travels down an axon. We talked last time about the features that speed it up and slow it down. What did we find out? What's going to cause the fastest, what kind of axon will allow the fastest movement of the action potential? A myelinated fiber that is large in diameter. And which type would be slowest? An unmyelinated, smaller diameter fiber, right? We get that. Um, remember, we're only talking about the signal of the electrical signal, the action potential. Remember, there are other things going on up and down the axon internally within the axoplasm. What's the axoplasm? The cytoplasm of the axon, right? And in there, there are things moving up and down. What do we call it when things are going from the soma down toward the terminus? That is, what kind of movement? Anterograde, right? Anterograde goes down the axon. And that could be fast or slow. We talked about two different types of movement. And then also, though, within the axon, there is retrograde movement. Molecules moving from the terminus back toward the soma. That's not the action potential, but again, those are organelles and some molecules, some nutrients, some waste products are definitely moving up and down the axon. Now, we've, we've already said how myelin is important for speeding up the conduction of the electrical signal. If an axon is unmyelinated, it means that it doesn't have the same sort of electrical duct tape or electrical tape around it like a myelinated axon. An unmyelinated axon, therefore, would not have what structure? Nodes of Ranvier. Not as obvious, OK? So let's talk about what an unmyelinated axon is. Now, an unmyelinated axon, though, still has Schwann cells helping to protect it, but the myelin is not wrapped around. If you look at a normal Schwann cell, and it's wrapping around part of an axon, it will do 100 layers of myelin. It's a, it's a very dense layer of myelin. If you look at a unmyelinated axon, you will still see Schwann cells in proximity to protecting the axon, but it doesn't wrap all the way around the axon. So that means that the electrical signal has to move more slowly down the entire length of the axon. And we'll see that here in a moment. Now, what does excitation do? 
the depolarizing event, what does it do? Let's think back. We've already said this. But the depolarizing of the neuron excites voltage-regulated or voltage-gated channels, right? And they're immediately distal to the action potential. What does that mean? Further down, right? So think distal in the arm or the leg. Same thing, we'll talk about proximal and distal within the action, within the axon. So as soon as you begin to stimulate an action potential, just ahead of it, you're opening up more of those sodium gates, right? Just kind of ahead of the action potential as it goes down the axon. And as we move down the axon, new sodium and new potassium gates will open just in front of the action potential. And you're going to be doing this whole little opening and closing of these channels down the entire length of the axon. And you get this chain reaction. And this chain reaction, this action potential, cannot be slowed down, right? It's going to go all the way to the end of the axon. It can't be pulled back. It can't be reversed. Um, and it is always an excitatory signal. It's always a positive signal going down the axon. So let's take a look at this picture and make sense of this. We're looking at just a, a, a neuron. We have on the left-hand side the dendrites, right? We get this in the cell body, and then the signal will be traveling distally down the axon. The big green cylinder is the axon. And look at the charges on it. And maybe this will help you understand the local event that I'm talking about. What do we see here? The inside of the cell is more what? See the negative signs? And the outside of the cell is lined by a bunch of positive signs. So that's telling us that the resting membrane potential, the inside's more negative, and the outside is more positive. Now, the action potential is shown here in red. And look what happens right here in the red area. Look at the charges. Remember, sodium and potassium changed places, didn't they? And the inside of the cell became more positive compared to the outside. That was that depolarizing event. But do you see that those charges are only reversed in that little tiny area? I know that the first thing that goes through my mind is, oh, the whole cell becomes positive on the inside during an action potential. No, just that little tiny area. Okay. Now, what do we see right behind it? So the action potential is progressing to the right. And imagine this is a time lapse. And this is time one. This is time two. This is time three. And as we move along, we see that red action potential move more and more to the right. Then look what's happening right behind the action potential. See the area of yellow? That yellow area represents the refractory period. So in other words, right along that axon, as the signal's going from left to right, right behind it, the axon is in a period of refraction where it cannot generate another action potential. But does that mean that I, am I restricted over here? Look where the pointer is. Am I restricted here to create another action potential? No. Am I restricted here? No. I'm only restricted where? I'm only restricted here in this refractory period. And where is it? Just behind, if you will, where, right, where the action potential just passed through. So I'm only in refractory period in that small section. And it's only there that there was this little tiny disturbance. See where the action potential is? That's where I see the negative and positive charges change places. Why do they change places? Sodium gates opened. Sodium did what? Rushed in, made the inside area just in that little area more positive, right? And leaving the outside more negative. So hopefully that's beginning to help you understand this idea of the action potential is progressing down the axon and just behind it, in a very localized little area, is the refractory period. What do we think? Say it again for me. Not in the absolute. It can fire again. Remember, remember this is being used over and over and over. But in that moment, now this does... 
No. But it's not saying if it's absolute or relative. Okay, now I, I, I'm with you. I wish this figure showed both relative and absolute refractory periods. So, so during, let's for the purpose of this, say that that yellow is the absolute refractory period. Okay, and there's no way. Now, maybe um, a little bit of it closer, further to the left would become now the relative refractory period. But right after it, let's go ahead and just agree that in this drawing, because it's not complete, that the majority of this yellow, the majority of this would be absolute refractory. The red area is where you're actually doing the, the uh, action potential, and I, and I see your concern, okay? But I just want to think that the red area is where the action potential is occurring, and then the yellow area is a refractory period just behind it. But I do see your concern with trying to figure out where absolute versus relative refractory is. Don't worry about it quite on this image. Oops. So let's go down a little further and see what we can discover here. Now, this is one of those videos, again, um, they won't let me play while I'm capturing this. So it's a good reminder to go back and look at this little presentation or this little video. Again, you can make these play in your PowerPoint only if you have your PowerPoint in presentation mode. So you have to be in the full screen presentation mode, then you can push the play button, and you'll also see most of these, pres these videos as you're doing your connect assignments. So we said that myelin allows the action potential to travel more quickly down the axon. Well, why? What is it about the myelin? We know that it's protective. We know that the Schwann cells are considered glial cells. They're there to protect and nourish and, and um, uh, maintain the neuron. But here's the deal. Do you agree that there are voltage-gated channels necessary for action potentials to occur? So when the neuron is stimulated, there are sodium channels that open that cause an electrical disturbance in a local way and that those voltage gated channels are necessary for action potentials. Well, it turns out that in the internode areas, there are only about 25 of these channels per cubic or per square um, micrometer, really small area, only 25. Now, what's the internodal area again? Internode means between the nodes, that is, it's the area where there's a Schwann cell covering it up. And in that area, there are very, very few of these sodium gates. However, in the nodes of Ranvier, the number goes from 25 to thousands, up to 12,000 of these sodium gates. Now, I don't know what comes first. I don't know when the myelin is being laid down if there's already this distribution of these sodium gates in place or if that redistribution occurs after myelin is laid down, okay? So I'm not gonna ask, you can think about it, but I don't know the answer. I don't know that we know the answer, but this is the reality of it. Once myelin gets laid down by the Schwann cells, then there are thousands and thousands of these sodium gates at the node and there are very, very few underneath so what this has the effect of is that the signal essentially looks like it's skipping from node to node to node, okay? So there is this weak signal that's occurring underneath the myelin, but it's still strong enough to stimulate a huge action potential at the next node. So you have like this transmission signal. This just keeps being regenerated all the way down the end to the axon terminus. That's how it maintains its, 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 uh, the non-decremental feature of it, how it keeps going down all the way to the end, is because at every node, there's a regeneration or a recharging of that action potential. It jumps up to the same spot. Always the same, positive 35. At each node, it's Yep, that's not changing. And action potentials is and always is the same exact curve, negative 70, negative 55, positive 35. Never changes. Now, when 
there is assault when the, there is myelin, and when the signal is essentially jumping quickly from node to node to node, this type of conduction is referred to as saltatory conduction. Now, the way I remember that is salt, sodium chloride. So I know that there is sodium gates involved, and it's happening, you know, along this jumping from node to node. That's just how I remember it. So saltatory conduction is the kind of conduction where you've got nodes of Ron VA. Absolutely. Give me a moment on that. Give me a moment on the question is what happens if the nerve gets stimulated over and over or there's more than one action potential traveling down the axon? What happens at the other end? Give me a minute. Okay? Give me a minute. Maybe a couple minutes, but we'll get there today. So, what we see then in this con cartoon, look at this outflow. What, what we see here, what's going in here? Boom. So at the node, there is a huge number of what? Sodium channels. And the sodium is going to be rushing in. And you see that, right? So that's initiating. Now, in between, in the internode region, there are much fewer of these sodium channels. Now, let's take a look at that story along with the one we learned earlier and take a look at this um, picture. Again, we're looking at a time lapse. The red areas, the red areas are the action potentials, just like before. They were looking at time lapse from, from left to right. And then the, behind it is the period of refraction. Everywhere else could be what? Re-excited, right? Every place else is at resting membrane potential and would have the potential of being re-excited. So it's just there. Now, again, when you have Schwann cells lining along like this, it's as if the signal jumps from node to node to node to node. And again, that is called saltatory conduction. Now, if you don't have a myelinated axon, then it's going to be a much slower signal going down the axon. Why did that happen again? So it's going to be a much, much slower signal going down the axon. So let's, let's get to the other end. So that's the end of our little story on the action potential, at least how it gets initiated and how it travels down. Let's figure out what happens on the other end at the axon terminus, right? What's, what do we find down there? At the telodendria or at the axon terminus, at the very end, there's a swollen area called the synaptic knob. And it's there that neurotransmitters will be released. When that signal reaches, when that action potential reaches the end, it will cause the release of neurotransmitters. That, that synaptic knob will be in very close proximity to either what? Another neuron or to a muscle, or to a gland. What will it do to the neuron? Stimulate, perhaps another signal to go to the next neuron. Or if it's going to muscle, it's going to tell the muscle to contract. If it's going to a gland, it's going to tell the gland to secrete. And what do we call those muscles and glands? We call those collectively the effectors, right? The effectors. So let's figure out what happens down here. You asked about calcium a few minutes ago, and let's figure out what's going on. So when that signal, here it's called a nerve signal, but we know that that nerve, sig that nerve signal is what? The action potential, right? So when that action potential gets all the way down to the end of the axon, it's going to trigger the release of the neurotransmitters, and that's going to cause another electrical stimulation further downstream. Where two cells come into close proximity, that's a synapse. Okay, now we, can, we know the meaning. Syn means what? S-Y-N? Together, right? To come together. And then A-P-S is a root that you'll see A-P-S or A-P-T, meaning to fit or fasten. So a synapse is where two cells fit or fasten together. Now, when we're talking about a synapse, 
The first neuron will be the presynaptic <coughs> neuron, and the second neuron will be the postsynaptic neuron. That's just a, a, a verbiage that we'll use, a naming we'll use when we're looking at a synapse. The presynaptic neuron will be the one releasing the neurotransmitter. The postsynaptic neuron would be the one receiving this neurotransmitter and its signal. Now, where can that presynaptic neuron synapse? We've already mentioned this. A synapse can occur anywhere where there is not myelin. So a presynaptic neuron has the ability of coming in and interacting with another neuron at its dendrites, somewhere on its soma, or even down at the terminus. Right down at the telodendria, you don't see Schwann cells down there. So even down there, you can have synapses. We're going to call these axodendritic, axosomatic, or axoaxonic synapses. Do those words make sense to you? If it's um, the axon going to a dendrite, that's axodendritic. If it's axon going to soma, axosomatic. If it's axon going to another axon down at the axon terminus, that's axoaxonic synapses. Now, typically, when we look at our pictures, our, our artist rendering, rendi rendering of a neuron, we see a dendrite with maybe 5, 6, 10, maybe 20 dendrites. I want to remind you that a neuron can have up to 10,000 dendrites and can have thousands and thousands of synaptic knobs as well. Okay, so this, these can be amazingly complex cells. In the cerebellum, what's the cerebellum doing for us? A lot of it, it has to do with our motor coordination and our balance. Some neurons there have as many as 100,000 synapses. One neuron is communicating with 100,000 other cells. Amazingly complex. Now, let's figure this out. So the synaptic cleft, we're back to the same dude who said what? Ramoni Cajal, what did he say? The neuron doctrine, which said what? The nervous system is not just a single wire, if you will, going from the brain to each of the effectors, but instead the nervous system is described as being a bunch of cells that are in series, right? One to, connected to the next, connected to the next. He also was the one who started describing these spaces, these gaps between those sequential neurons. And finally, about 1921, so we're going on about 90 years ago, we figured out that there were chemicals released between one cell and the next. And all of this work early on was, was using frogs. In fact, as you did the Phil's experiment, right, they were describing that they were doing this wet lab that you were simulating with the gastrocnemius muscle of a frog or, the, or some of the nerves of a frog. So classically, much of our neurophysiology and action potential work was first described in frogs. No one gets too upset about a big old aquarium of frogs and uh, working with them, so um, at least not in the old days. So they would simply use the vagus nerve. Remember the vagus nerve? Big old cranial nerve number 10. It's a big old nerve, and they would use that nerve oftentimes and when you stimulate the nerve, they discovered on the other end that substances were released. Okay, so this was just the beginning of understanding chemicals were involved within the nervous system. It wasn't just electrical signals. Right? That was a big wake-up call. It's not just electrical signals you know, causing something to be zapped. In fact, there were chemicals involved in this story as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what we'll see is that the signal goes from electrical down the axon. Chemicals are released. And those chemicals, as we'll understand before we leave here today, are then going to cause another electrical disturbance. So it does. It goes electrical to chemical to electrical most oftentimes. Now, the first neurotransmitter described was acetylcholine. Okay? And acetylcholine, I will tell you now, is the neurotransmitter that controls your muscles. So that was the first one. It's the most common neurotransmitter in your body, and uh, that's the one that we've discussed in passing in 105. 
Now, there are electrical synapses, okay? Uh, that is where the cell sends an electrical signal directly from one cell to the next and does not use chemicals. And we've talked about those in the past. Where have we seen electrical synapses before? In the heart, as specifically what we call the intercalated discs, right? The intercalated discs are an example of an electrical synapse. That is, the signal comes in, right, from the SA node, we know this a little bit, right, from the, from the heart, the pacemaker of the heart, and that signal spreads very, very quickly throughout the heart, not with, without use of chemicals, just direct electrical stimulation. So that's an electrical synapse. And it, and it says here cardiac, okay? Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that. When we get to muscle uh, in the second test, we will describe cardiac muscle versus smooth muscle versus skeletal muscle. And we'll come at it from a viewpoint of how they act differently with the nervous system. Most of the time, however, we have a chemical synapse. Because what do chemical synapses do? Let's make sure we appreciate this. What, what's the advantage of an electrical synapse? The advantage of the electrical synapse is it's very, very quick. There are no chemicals involved. There, we don't have to wait for a chemical to be released and then to be taken up. But you lose some control. So yes, Electrical synapses do occur in our body, and yes, they're very, very rapid, but we lose control. The extra chemicals that are involved in most synapses will allow more fine-tuning of the signals. So our nervous system is not just a bunch of wires, right, but instead a lot of fine-tuning with chemicals as well as electrical signals. So here is a, uh, the, this is a pre- Sorry, this is a uh, synaptic knob. All of these in this picture, these are all synaptic knobs. And what are they doing? They're all coming down and touching what? This big thing is a soma, right? So you see here that there are many, many, many synapses occurring on the soma. Many axons are coming down and interacting with this soma simultaneously. So what do we find in the synaptic knob? Neurotransmitters. And where were those neurotransmitters made? They're stored in vesicles, but where in the cell were they made? Way up in the soma. Right now, if we're talking about a neuron that's a meter long, going from your spinal cord to your big toe, the soma for that long motor neuron is up in your spinal cord, isn't it? So the neurotransmitters are made way up there, way up in the, in the soma. And then they traveled by what kind of movement? Anterograde. And they travel down along those microtubules all the way down to the synaptic knob. Okay. And then they sit down there and they're just waiting waiting to be released. By what process do you suppose neurotransmitters are released from the synaptic knob? That little vesicle is going to bleb with the cell membrane of the neuron and exocytose. So we're going to see exocytosis of the neurotransmitter from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. So the presynaptic neuron is going to release the neurotransmitters. The postsynaptic neuron is going to do what? Have receptors to receive that neurotransmitter. Now here's another word I need to add to our vocabulary. Ligand-gated or ligand-regulated ion gates. A ligand is anything that attaches to a receptor. Okay. So when this neurotransmitter touches this receptor, that receptor, that's now a ligand, that receptor is oftentimes a, a gate, and that gate's going to open in response. A few moments ago, we talked about voltage-gated channels. Those voltage-gated channels opened in response to voltage changes. If it's a ligand-gated channel, that gate will open in response to some molecule attaching to the receptor. 
ligand-gated sodium channels, ligand-gated potassium channels. You'll hear that verbiage. So here is our cartoon of a chemical synapse. Chemical, molecule, same thing, okay? So it's a neurotransmitter, is the ligand here. So let's take a look. We'll look at this. We're going to break this down in pieces and parts. So we are looking at the very end of a telodendria, and this is the synaptic knob, okay? So we're at the very, very end. One neuron could have thousands of these little synaptic knobs at the end of all of its collective telodendria. In here, I see some microtubules. Remember, the microtubules were important for what? Structure and support, but also, remember, it was along microtubules that the vesicles were traveling. Remember, there was a dynin and the kinesin, and the kinesin was that motor carrier that pulled things down anterograde to the end, and it followed the microtubules like a railroad track. And it was the dynin that carried things retrograde. So we see the microtubules. We also see a lot of mitochondria. What? Remember, mitochondria do what? Make ATP. Now, where do you normally expect to find mitochondria? Up in the soma. But oh, oh, look, there are some down here. How they get there? Anterograde, right? They're moving along up and down the axon. And then we see all of these little collective bubbles. Those bubbles are all synaptic vesicles. They're filled with neurotransmitters. Again, those neurotransmitters were made way up on the ribosome and the endoplasmic reticulum. Those neurotransmitters were then packaged in the Golgi apparatus that was also up there in the soma. And those uh, synaptic vesicles blebbed off from the Golgi and traveled down the length of the axon. So this would be the presynaptic neuron, and this down here would be the postsynaptic neuron. As the electrical signal comes down, it's going to cause these synaptic vesicles to exocytose, right? Release their chemicals. Those chemicals are going to travel across a very thin distance. That distance or that space is called the synaptic cleft. Okay, the cleft, that's the space. And that neurotransmitter is gonna move across and then be picked up. These orange guys down here are the neurotransmitter receptors, and they're found on the postsynaptic cell. Now, what do you think those receptors are going to do? They're going to receive that neurotransmitter, and what do you think that neurotransmitter is going to cause this postsynaptic neuron to do? Fire? What kind of signal? Local or action? A local potential. Right, because where are we coming in? We're coming in at a dendrite or at a soma. So what are we forming? We're creating another local potential. We're, we're initiating a excitability. We're, we're, we're teasing or, or tickling that next neuron. So what have we done? We, we've caused a local disturbance on the next neuron. Now, again, if that disturbance is great enough and that stirp, disturbance reaches the axon hillock of the next neuron, then we would fire another action potential. Right now, we're just creating another. The action potential is creating a local potential in the next neuron. Question. Or the soma. It's wherever a synapse can occur. Again, where can a synapse occur? Dendrites, somas, or down at the axon terminals. But we're not really thinking about that yet, but we will in a minute. Absolutely. Right now, we're dealing with neuron to neuron. What we'll get to in the next section will be a neuron going to a muscle. That's a neuromuscular junction. You saw a picture of that in the lab last week. 
that little electrode looking picture. And that was a neuron coming down and interacting, synapsing on a muscle, telling that muscle to contract. Absolutely. Right now, though, this is neuron to neuron. So this could be neuron to muscle or neuron to gland. Right now, it's neuron to neuron. Now, it's not all about acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is by far the most common neurotransmitter in our body. It is the neurotransmitter that controls our muscles, our skeletal muscles, but there are many, many more. And we're gonna talk about some of these right now. So the one you know, the one that you love, the, maybe the only one that you know, is acetylcholine. It's its own class. There are different classes of these neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine all by itself, it gets that name because it's actually made up of acetic acid and choline, basically vinegar. It's amazing, right? It's a little vinegar molecule in a way. Now there's also a group of neurotransmitters that are made up primarily of amino acids. Remember, amino acids are the building blocks for your proteins. So for example, glycine, glutamate, aspartate, these are all amino acids. And they are also specifically released by some neurons as neurotransmitters. There's another one called gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA. We'll be talking about GABA more. Okay, GABA. There's another group of these neurotransmitters referred to as the monoamines. This includes epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, histamine, serotonin, maybe some of these you've heard of, but all of those are grouped into this thing called the monoamines. So epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, histamine, serotonin. Now you've heard about histamine in other ways, right? Histamine, that molecule that's released by some of our uh, cells, our immune cells that cause us to get a runny nose, right? So we're going to see that some of these molecules have different purposes. If I said epinephrine to you, you're thinking, oh, sympathetic nervous system, right? Epinephrine or adrenaline. And that's true. And we'll see that that's a neurotransmitter that can be a, affect your nervous system. And then there's a last group called the neuropeptides. Peptides found or used only in the brain, right? Neuropeptides. So we have acetylcholine, the amino acids, some of them, the monoamines, and then the neuropeptides, four different groups of neurotransmitters. I'm not going to expect you to recognize these, but I, I do want you to see that this is just the four groups of them chemically shown to you. So acetylcholine, very small molecule. Amino acids are also very small molecules. Here are the monoamines, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and then those neuropeptides have names like endorphins. Have you heard of endorphins? Maybe you've heard of endorphins. Um, enkephalin, maybe you've heard of enkephalin, a uh, substance P, but we'll be coming back and talking about a few of these neuropeptides along the conversation as well. So let's start off with the neuropeptides here. Um, they are small, right? They're peptides. When you hear the word peptide, you're thinking it's a small protein made of two or more amino acids. And uh, they work in very, very low concentrations. Now, this is true of many neurotransmitters. They work in very low concentrations. So this is really difficult work to quantify. They, however, have a very long-lasting effect. So they don't get broken down very easily. Some of these neurotransmitters you might better recognize as hormones or as neuromodulators. Now, neuromodulators. Something that's going to what? Modulate the nervous system. When you hear the word modulate, what comes to mind? Molecules that can somehow change, influence, right? The, the nervous system. Remember we said that the chemical nature of our nervous system allows it to be highly regulated. And we're going to see that there are a lot of these chemicals, these neuromodulators that are going to be able to come in and influence, modify the overall signals that are traveling through one's nervous system. There are even some of these neuropeptides released by our gut. Wow, that research is in the last 20 years or so, where we now know that the 
contents of your stomach and your level of fullness, there are signals that travel back to your brain and basically say, stop eating, dummy. Right? But that, those signals take a while sometimes to travel back. So we'll talk about some of those gut-brain peptides. It's amazing the connections we're finding now between the brain and the gut. We used to think, oh, those are completely separated things. There's a huge connection now in research between the gut and the brain. Amazing research going on right now. So what happens at the synapse? Let's talk about what happens here. Again, what do we know? The neurotransmitter is released from the presynaptic neuron. It is going to travel across the cleft. And why did it get released? Because an action potential came down that neuron and told those synaptic vesicles to exocytose and release those products. And then once that neurotransmitter is released, it's going to go across the cleft and be picked up or bind to what? Receptors on the postsynaptic cell. And those molecules are now going to alter that neuron and tell it to do something. Now, what's really cool is that any one neurotransmitter has different effects on different parts of the body. Did you ever think about why is it when you're in a sympathetic surge, right? A bear walks in the room and you're suddenly scared. Why is it that some blood vessels dilate and other blood vessels constrict, right? And it's the same molecule. You've got epinephrine traveling through your body. You've got adrenaline. And yet your body responds to it in different ways. Why is that? Because your body has different receptors. Same idea here. There are different receptors that are affected differently by neuro, different neurotransmitters. For example, just as an example, serotonin. All right, one neurotransmitter has 14 different receptor types. In other words, serotonin can affect the body in 14 different ways, or not at all. Remember that a neurotransmitter or a hormone can only be perceived or affected by a cell that has the receptor. So if a cell doesn't have the receptor, that's yet a different response, right? There is no response at all. And then there are 14 other variations on the theme. So one molecule can have vastly different responses on different parts of the body. Oh, absolutely. We can lose receptors. We can lose the ability to make those receptors, um, or receptors be can become less uh, reactive or less sensitive. Painkillers, or even maybe we know about uh, type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, the, the uh, receptor for insulin becomes in, in, inactive, if you will, or not as responsive. So absolutely, we can change our number of receptors as well as change our reaction to those receptors throughout our body. Absolutely. Now, depending upon what kind of receptor you have, is going to dictate what that particular neurotransmitter does to that cell. So some... Uh, sometimes serotonin would be excitatory, for example, and sometimes uh, serotonin would be inhibitory, just depending upon what's going on in the cell and where you are. So, again, neurotransmitters, these molecules released by neurons, some of them are excitatory. What does that suggest to you? That it's going to cause the next neuron to become more excited or more likely to fire an action potential. But sometimes, a neurotransmitter will be received by a cell, and it will actually the cell, cause the cell to chill. Right? It'll, it'll cause the neuron to become less activated or, in essence, inhibit it. We'll talk about those. Yep. Um, again, depending on what kind of cell you have, what kind of receptor you have is going to indicate what happens. Some neurotransmitters are going to open ligand-gated ion channels. What does that mean? So let's say it's acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, and it goes to the postsynaptic cell. And what is that? That, that acetylcholine is now considered the ligand. The ligand binds to the receptor, and in response to that binding, the gate opens. Other times, neurotransmitters will act through a second messenger system, and I'll describe that. It's a little bit different. It's not a direct effect. It's more of a secondary effect. 
Now, there's three kinds of synapses that I want you to know about. Now, hold on to me. This is a new vocabulary for most of you. Excitatory cholinergic synapse. That is, it's a synapse, two neurons coming together, where it's excitatory, and the word cholinergic tells you what kind of a uh, neurotransmitter was used. Cholinergic acetylcholine, right? So this will be acetylcholine. Inhibitory GABAergic synapse. Two cells come together, a synapse. The presynaptic cell now releases GABA, and GABA was one of those amino acid receptor or amino acid neurotransmitters. And as a result, the cell does not become activated. The postsynaptic cell actually becomes inhibited. It makes it more difficult to fire the next potential. Or there can be excitatory adrenergic synapses. You tell me, what do you think is going on there? Adrenaline, right? Okay, so we have acetylcholine or adrenaline. We see those words kind of in there and either excitatory or inhibitory. We'll talk more about those synapses in a moment. Does it make sense to you that it takes time for all this to happen? It takes time for the electrical signal to come down. It takes time for the neurotransmitter to be released. It takes time for the neurotransmitter to go across the cleft and to be picked up by the postsynaptic receptor and then to initiate the response. Therefore, there's a delay, isn't there? Every time there's a chemical synapse, there's going to be a slight delay. Now, this is amazingly fast. We're talking milliseconds here. But still, the more synapses, the longer this signal will take to go from one point to another. Yes, so the question is for the uh, inhibitory synapse, the GABA, ergic. GABA is what's released as a neurotransmitter from the presynaptic cell. The postsynaptic cell receives that GABA, but that GABA causes the next cell, the postsynaptic cell, to become inhibited. What do you think would cause that to happen? At, at the, when we're thinking about ions here for a second, at the synapse, you know that if sodium channels open, it causes the cell to become more excited. So what do you think, how do you think GABA works? When GABA reaches the postsynaptic cell, what do you think GABA is going to cause the cell to do? A gate's going to open, but what kind of gate? Potassium. It could be a potassium gate. That's a good idea, because what would happen then? If the, it, I'm just saying if, we're thinking down the right channels, if GABA were to open a potassium gate, the cell would become even more negative on the inside. Do you remember why? Potassium is usually found on the inside. If it opened a potassium gate, you'd be losing positive charges. The cell would become even more negative. If the inside of the cell is even more negative, then it will be more difficult to reach threshold. So what else? You're right. Potassium would be a likely culprit. What else might we be able to open up instead of sodium or potassium that would cause the inside of the cell to become more negative? Chlorine channels. Chlorine is, N, is Cl minus. What do we know? Where does sodium usually get, where does uh, chlorine usually get found? wherever sodium is found, right? So chlorine is usually found in great concentrations on the outside. If you were to cause the cell to open up a chlorine channel, we never talked about those before, but they exist. If you open up a chlorine channel, now chlorine would do what? Rush from the outside in, and you're bringing what into the cell? More negative charges. Again, the more negative the cell is, the more difficult it's going to be for that cell to reach negative 55 threshold. Okay? So the opening of potassium or the opening of chlorine channels would be really good possible choices to cause the neuron to become less activated or to become inhibited. Because nope, because these channels are specific. Just because the gates open doesn't mean anything can go through it. The gates are specific. 
So a, a sodium channel only allows sodium through. A chlorine channel only allows chlorine through. The gates aren't open. The sodium gates only let the sodium in. You're right. Chlorine is usually found in greater concentrations outside of the cell, where the sodium is usually found in greater concentrations. But when you open a sodium gate, it only lets sodium through. So chlorine is being left behind. Can't come through with it. Okay. Now, even though there is a delay, and even though it does take time for these chemicals to be released and picked up and to propagate the signal, there is a delay. But man, it's fast, right? Half a millisecond, half a millisecond. So things we can barely even imagine. This is so fast. Nice little video for you to watch. Great little video for you to watch. Now let's talk about these excitatory cholinergic synapses. I'll give you a couple more minutes and then we'll take a little break. But excitatory cholinergic synapse. We've already kind of broken down what it means. The, the neurotransmitter here is going to be acetylcholine right, ACH, and when it is received, it's going to be excitatory. Acetylcholine, most popular, common neurotransmitter in your body, is the one that causes your skeletal muscles to contract, but it's not always excitatory. There will be examples, as we'll see, where acetylcholine is actually an inhibitory neurotransmitter. But as we normally think of acetylcholine, the first thing that will come to mind will be skeletal muscle and excitation causing the muscle to contract. That's your first thought when it comes to acetylcholine. And here's what happens, okay? So we've got this synaptic knob. The signal comes down. The action potential comes down to the, to the knob. It's going to cause the release of vesicles containing acetylcholine. Acetylcholine comes across the cleft and oh, look what happens. As the acetylcholine comes out, now the acetylcholine is the green. I know this is really small. That's the green molecule. And do you see that this little orange receptor here has two little acetylcholines attached to it? So this would be what kind of gate? Ligand gated channel. So when the acetylcholines bind to it, what happens? That channel opens. And I'm telling you now, that channel is a, we can see it right now, that channel is a sodium channel. So as sodium comes rushing into the postsynaptic neuron, what happens? A local depolarization. It's not an action potential yet, right? It's just a local potential. There's been a disturbance of the membrane. Sodium has come in. And if there's enough of a disturbance, then what will happen? potentially an action potential at the axon hillock. But this is now, at this point, just another little disturbance, a little dis uh, electrical stimulation of the postsynaptic neuron. A little video to watch. Let's talk about inhibitory. We already guessed this, okay? We, we guessed two things as a class. I hope you were following that along. But here we've got an inhibitory GABAergic synapse. The, neuro, the, the neurotransmitter here is GABA. GABA. Easier to say than gamma amino butyric acid, right? So just GABA. And again, the action potential travels down the end of the axon, but not acetylcholine. Instead, this particular neuron releases GABA. When GABA is picked up by the postsynaptic cell, the real story is that it opens up chloride channels. Okay? You guys guessed another possibility, but chloride is absolutely right. And as chloride comes in, you can appreciate it's now going to make the inside of the cell more negative, making it what? More difficult to become stimulated to reach the negative 55 threshold. So when a neuron releases GABA, it causes the next cell to actually be inhibited, less likely to have an action potential. But guess what? Remember we said earlier that local potentials could be either excitatory or inhibitory. What's being formed here? When GABA reaches the next cell, that is a negative local potential. 
and it's causing that next neuron to be even less likely to fire. Whereas if it's an excitatory local potential, it's making it more likely that the next neuron will fire an action potential. So now what we see is that one cell is receiving both excitatory acetylcholine signals, and that same cell could be simultaneously receiving inhibitory GABA signals. And then what does this cell have to do? Add it all up, right? How many positive signals are coming in? How many negative signals are coming in? And the neuron says, okay, if there's enough positive charges coming in, if there's enough of, a, of an excitatory signal, then I'll probably fire an action potential. But if I keep getting these negative GABA signals coming in, I'm not going to fire my next action potential. I'm being told none, right? I'm being told do not fire an action potential down the next axon. And then that third type, excitatory adrenergic synapse, okay? Now, this one is going to use not acetylcholine, not GABA, but instead adrenergic, you're thinking epinephrine or norepinephrine. Now, just a little bit of an aside here. These do not open gates directly. Acetylcholine caused a ligand-gated sodium channel to open. GABA caused a ligand-gated chlorine channel to open. Norepinephrine is going to work through a second messen messenger system, and this uses an intermediate molecule called cyclic AMP. I'm not going to dive into all the gory details here. We could spend two lectures on this, just here. Stop right here and talk for two days. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you that, though, when norepinephrine comes in, there's not a direct ion gate, but instead another mechanism that gets that signal inside that postsynaptic cell. It's slower than the other two because the other two directly open gates. They had a direct connection and those gates were opened quickly. But one of the advantages of the cyclic AMP system is that it can cause an amplification. In other words, one molecule of norepinephrine can cause a vast number of internal signals to occur. More about that, though, as we move forward. Um, let me just show you this picture. I'll answer a question, then we'll take a quick break. So this is the same, this is the third type. Uh, this is the excitatory adrenergic. Same idea. Action potential comes down. Neurotransmitter is released. What neurotransmitter? Norepinephrine. And norepinephrine, though, does not directly, it does bind to the receptor. But this receptor is not an ion gate. So when the norepinephrine binds to this receptor, it does not open a gate, but instead causes another series of signals to occur that eventually do cause gates to open. And I know that's confusing, but it's like the norepinephrine comes in and triggers a few other steps that eventually cause a sodium gate to open, but it's not a direct opening. It's a delayed opening. And then eventually, those sodium channels are going to cause changes inside the cell. Inside the cell. Question here, and then a quick break to let your mind get around these synapses. So, does a drug like morphine um, inhibit the release or release of... Um, the question is, does a drug like morphine somehow modulate or affect these like pain GABA. signals and GABA? You're on the right track. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. So good question. You're just a little bit ahead of your time. So let's take about a five-minute break. Just kind of stretch. Think about this. Process some ideas. We'll come back and we'll pick up on how we turn off these signals. So we've talked about action potentials. And we know they travel down. And we know there's a synapse. And at the synapse, neurotransmitters are released. Now we have to turn them off. So right now, all we've said is, oh, neurotransmitters are released. Right? And, they, and they excite or inhibit the next cell along the way. But how do we shut off those action? How do we set, shut off those signals? Right? Otherwise, the next cell would be constantly inhibited or constantly excited. So we have to realize that these neurotransmitters bind to their receptors for only about a millisecond. Right? Really, really fast. 
they, they, they kind of touch the receptor, they trigger the signal, and then they dissociate, they hop off from the receptor. So they're very short-lived, right? They hop on, hop off. And now, if the presynaptic cell continues to get excited, and Josh, this comes back to you, if the, if the signal is continuing, if the neuron is sending more and more signals down the axon, and every time that signal gets to the end, it releases more neurotransmitters. And there's a constant release of neurotransmitters. Then you would continue to excite the next cell. But if you only had one little action potential travel down the axon, it would just simply send that little zinger, doop, cause those neurotransmitters to be released and to associate with the next neuron. But then they would dissociate and essentially stop the signal from going on. So very, very quickly. So if you're continuing, if you have a lot of action potentials traveling down the axon and you're constantly, constantly releasing more neurotransmitters, then those molecules would hop on, right, and continue to stimulate the postsynaptic neuron, right? Continue to keep those sodium gates open on the next cell. And that's kind of what happens here. But not, that's not enough. That's not all that happens. There also has to be uh, a couple more mechanisms. Because if we continue to, um, if we didn't have a mechanism of getting rid of the neurotransmitters, we'd have a lot of problems, right? We wouldn't be able to move our fingers up and down quickly. We wouldn't be able to make quick discerning decisions because we'd be waiting for the nervous system to kind of catch up with our intentions. It's like trying to watch YouTube when you got bad connectivity. Right? Things just aren't as smooth because you're having to wait for that buffering, if you will. So we want to minimize that buffering. We want to get rid of any signal as quickly as we need to so that we can change directions or do something else with our, with our action potentials. So here's what's going on. In addition to uh, not including more neurotransmitters, we also want to get rid of what we've already released. In the central nervous system, um, astrocytes, right? Remember astrocytes? They're one of the glial cells. The astrocytes were helping to maintain the blood-brain barrier. The astrocytes were up there regulating fluid movement. But astrocytes also are known to reabsorb extra neurotransmitters. That's in the CNS. In the, uh, at the synaptic knob, there is also reabsorption of amino acids and monoamines. What were some of monoamines again? Name for me a couple of monoamines. Neuropeptides. Not the neuropeptides, that was the other group. Oh, epinephrine. epinephrine, norepinephrine, right? Some of those are called the monoamine group. Some of those monoamines are taken back up. When we think about, so far, when I've said neurotransmitters, how are they released into the cleft? exocytosis, right? They're leaving the cell and going into the cleft. But we know there's also a endocytotic process that occurs down here at the synaptic knob. In other words, the cell is able to clean up, erase, recapture some of these uh, neurotransmitters. There are also the ability to break down some neurotransmitters with monoamine oxidase. Monoamine oxidase, it's an enzyme that does what? ACE, that breaks down monoamines. Now, maybe some of you have heard about MAO inhibitors, right? These are some molecules that people take for different depressive moods and different neuropsychological reasons. And the MAOI inhibitors do what? Inhibit the MAO, right? They inhibit this breakdown. So if you're taking a, a mono monoamine oxidase inhibitor, what are you effectively doing? Allowing the monoamines to stay around longer in the cleft. And one of those monoamines is serotonin. Serotonin is definitely one of the mood-altering alter neurotransmitters. So people take an MAOI, and it's supposed to be a mood enhancer for those who are having depressive moods, because it allows that serotonin or other monoamines to stick around longer and have a better chance of affecting, in a positive way, mood. We'll, we'll see this come up along the way. 
So that's those antidepressants, right? They inhibit these MAOs. And also, for example, acetylcholine, there's an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, abbreviated ACHE, and this is an ACE, an enzyme, that breaks down acetylcholine. So when you think about your muscles and you're releasing acetylcholine to cause your muscles to contract, well, if you want to relax your muscle, you would have to do what? Get rid of any and all acetylcholine causing that muscle to contract. And so we would have to clean this area up very, very quickly. So you release acetylcholine, but then almost immediately, get rid of it. Release it, get rid of it. You only want your muscles to contract when you want it. So what happens is that the acetylcholine esterase degrades the acetylcholine into its components. Remember I told you the acetylcholine is made up of acetate or acetic acid, basically vinegar, and choline. And what happens is that the choline gets reabsorbed and the acetate gets broken down. Now, in addition to um, <coughs> removing the neurotransmitters, there are also neuromodulators. I've already mentioned this word. Neuromodulators, molecules that can modify, change, influence the nervous system. Sometimes these are, are neuropeptides. Sometimes neuromodulators can be hormones. And basically what they're going to do is stimulate a neuron, uh, causing that neuron to increase its number of receptors. So if I want to make a neuron more sensitive to a signal, I could do one of two things. I could, could increase the number of neurotransmitters, or I could increase the number of receptors. So a lot of neuromodulators tell the cell, hey, make more receptors. And if you make more receptors, now that cell becomes more responsive to a low number of molecules. Or these neuromodulators can, again, affect the rate of synthesis, the rate of release, or the rate of uptake of these different neurotransmitters. One group that you may have heard about are enkephalins. Okay, enkephalins are a group of neuromodulators. They are small peptides. They're part of that neuropeptide family, and they inhibit spinal interneurons from transmitting pain signals. So enkephalins would be released to stop pain signals. So a lot of the morphines and some of the medications actually in cause enkephalins to be released, and that blocks pain signals from going up to the brain. So you're never consciously aware of the pain. There's another neuromodulator I want you to know about, and that is nitric oxide. This was really a surprise. Everyone thought, once we figured out the nervous system was a bunch of electrical signals that caused chemicals to be released, everyone thought that all neurotransmitters must be, therefore, proteins. They must all be chemicals that could be, you know, measured, if you will. Nitric oxide, oh my goodness, it's a gas, right? Nitric oxide is a gas, and it itself is a neuromodulator and in some places, it's considered a neurotransmitter. So it's not just molecules that can be taken up by receptors, but gases that can easily move in and out of membranes. So it turns out that neuro nitric oxide does not need a receptor, right, to be picked up by the postsynaptic cell. Instead, it diffuses. It's a, it's a gas. It just kind of comes in like oxygen or CO2. And uh, it has a lot of other ways of talking to um, neurons, but this is one of the evidences that chemical communication in neurons is not necessarily all unidirectional. Let me say that again. We used to think that all movement, all chemical signals, all energy was moving from presynaptic and only moving toward the postsynaptic cell. Nitric oxide showed us that there is backward communication, that there is communication from the postsynaptic cell going back to the presynaptic cell. Okay, so some of the information at the synapse is bidirectional.
hang in there. Hang in there. Let me, let me keep going, and, and we'll see if that doesn't make more sense in a few minutes. Okay. And that's where we're heading right now, this idea of neural integration. So, so far I've told you that neurons can receive signals. Those signals can be received at dendrites or somas. And we've now learned also that those signals can be either excitatory or they can be inhibitory. And that now that neuron has to do what? Integrate. Pull all of those signals coming in simultaneously and make sense of them. Some neurons have 10,000 dendrites. Right? There could be 10,000 signals coming in simultaneously into a neuron, some of them excitatory, some of them inhibitory. And now that neuron has to make sense of all of those signals coming in in a very rapid fire. Again, if all those signals, or if, if the majority of those signals are excitatory, then more than likely that neuron will do what? Fire and action potential and travel to the next neuron. If instead the majority of those signals are inhibitory, then that marks the end of that signal, doesn't it? Because that neuron would not then fire an action potential. That's some of what's going on. So how is the neuron going to integrate all of these signals? We've already said that the synapse, there's a delay. Right? There's a slight delay because of the chemicals having to be released and accepted. Did I see a question? It's still a local. Remember that local potential, okay. Local potentials can be inhibitory or excitatory. Right? And the collection of all of those local potentials coming in can do what? Cause a neuron to become at threshold and cause an action potential or could inhibit an action potential from occurring. Coming together, it, it, it's just a story that we need to pull it all together. So all these little pieces are going to come together into a story. Now, the more synapses there are in a neural pathway, right? For one thing to happen in your body, it has to go from neuron to neuron to neuron. Some of your senses require three axons. Some of them only require two. Some require four. We'll talk more about that later. But the more synapses there are along a pathway, the longer it could take. But also, the more synapses, the more control you could have, right? You could have more modulators, more possibilities to influence those signals. One thing, though, that is true is that synapses are not affected by the length of a fiber. Why? Because, remember, action potentials are all or none, and they're not decremental. So how long an axon is not going to have anything to do with how well this whole thing can be regulated. It's all about the number of synapses. So I think I've already said this, but why do we need synapses? Because we need to not just have a wire that goes from my brain to my finger. We need to be able to control this with much greater sensitivity. So we want to have a lot of synapses so we can have lots of chemical interactions and lots of modulations along the way. There are, now we're talking about going up into the cortex. Remember, when I say cortex of the brain, you're thinking about going up into the most uh, conscious part of our brain, up into the part of our brain where we're making voluntary decisions or becoming aware of sensations. And some of those cells up in the cortex are called pyramidal cells, and those can have 40,000 synapses, right? 40,000 synapses with a neuron. So you've got 40,000 signals coming in at once. This is an amazing amount of integration, amazing amount of uh, number of signals coming in simultaneously. And then crazy numbers, your cortex, your cerebral cortex, 100 trillion, or 10 to the 14 synapses. Now, as we get older, we do start losing synapses, right? And some of you do activities that hurry that breakdown along, OK? Uh, but with aging, we will lose some synapses. Yeah?
No, not really. Now, compared to what it's short, like say they're the same amount or the same length, but five in a round, which one would make it sit there faster? Like the people who are doing at the same time would be the long one or the five short ones? Or does it matter? This happens all so fast that the length of the axon really is not of concern, okay? Be because it just happens so fast. So we're really not gonna be see delays. The, the, the delay that we're going to see from a signal coming in and going to your brain will not be related to the length of the axon as much as it will be the number of synapses because each synapse is gonna have a slight delay in the chemicals being released and propagating the signal. The length of the axon really will not have any appreciable distance. It's like within the distance of our body. Remember we said two meters per second? Right? I mean, we're talking really, really fast movement. So within the body, the size of our body, the length of the neuron, the length of the axon is not going to have an appreciable influence. What's going to have an appreciable influence on the time delay is going to be the number of synapses. Yeah, the question was, I mean, yes, it will take longer for the signal to travel down a neuron from your spinal cord to your big toe versus a little interneuron, little guy that's a centimeter long. But again, it's such a small difference that it would not be something we could appreciably measure in our everyday experience. We'll just leave it there. Okay. So what, is your, what do your neurons have to do? Integrate all of this incoming information and make decisions, right? Instantaneous decisions. It's a phenomenal system. It's amazing. So this whole neural integration is based on what you already know to be true. That, and I'm going to repeat some of the story, the average, the, the typical neuron has a resting membrane potential of negative 70, has a threshold of negative 55. That hasn't changed. So we have to think about all of these signals coming in. Now hold on with me. I've got another word for what we've already described. Post-synaptic potentials. Now, I know a few moments ago I said they were local potentials, and that's, that's not wrong, okay? But we're going to kind of change our vocabulary here. When a neuron sends the signal down the axon and it releases chemicals, and now the post-synaptic cell picks up those signals, that is a local potential. And I told you local potentials could either be excitatory or they could be inhibitory. We're going to change that name here. It's the same idea. We're going to say that there's EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potential. I'm absolutely okay with your thinking about this being a local potential, okay? But it's an excitatory potential. And where is it? It's on the postsynaptic cell. So what would an EPSP do? It would make the next neuron more likely to fire. That is more likely to reach threshold, more likely to send an action potential down its axon. Okay. In the brain, glutamate, aspartate are excitatory neurotransmitters that form or cause EPSPs. I haven't talked about those before. I mentioned them. Right? They were amino acids, glutamate and aspartate. They're used in the brain. They're excitatory. They cause EPSPs. Other, I already mentioned one, other neurotransmitters cause IPSPs, inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. What did we already talk about that always does this? GABA, right? GABA does this. Um, it doesn't even have it here listed, I don't think. But GABA in the brain causes IPSPs because what does it do? Opens chlorine channels. I think we've got that figured out. We can imagine what's going on with those chlorine channels opening. So by the definition of the name, this is only happening in between This is in the post synaptic cell. Right. So the question is, as you touch something, right, with your skin, when you touch something with your finger, you are causing a local potential in the nerve endings, right? Now, if I touch something 
uh, lightly, just a few neurons will fire. If I touch it more, more hard, right, or pinch myself, I'm going to send more signals, a greater sensation, right? Um, and and those, those local potentials are going to cause an action potential to travel up my arm, right, a sensory neuron, and go into my brain. But the next neuron along the, sig along the sequence, I would say, cause an EPSP or an IPSP. It is a local potential. I, I don't like this changing vocabulary, but it's just the reality that we have. Neuron to neuron, post-synaptic, right? The next neuron in the sequence. Now, here it is. So glycine and GABA, the two Gs. Now, I shouldn't say the two Gs. Glutamate was excitatory. But glycine and GABA are inhibitory. Also, acetylcholine. What did we say before? Acetylcholine was excitatory toward skeletal muscle. And I mentioned in a little foot, footnote that sometimes acetylcholine is inhibitory. True. Norepinephrine, when you think of epinephrine, what do you normally think of? Excitatory, right? Causing the body to go into a sympathetic overdrive. But there are situations where norepinephrine is also inhibitory. And you know that to be true because you know that the blood flow, when you've got a sympathetic surge, blood flow to the kidneys goes down, whereas blood flow to the skeletal muscles goes up. So you already know that the sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine and norepinephrine sometimes cause an excitatory response and other times cause an inhibitory response. What's the difference? The receptor type, right? It's the same neurotransmitters, the same molecule traveling through your blood, through your nerves, but it's causing a different response because there's a different type of, of um, receptor. And I think someone asked me earlier, but acetylcholine does excite skeletal muscle, but it actually inhibits cardiac muscle. Okay? So keep that in mind. It does excite skeletal muscle, but acetylcholine inhibits or causes IPSPs when you're talking about cardiac muscle. So take a look at this and see if this doesn't make good sense to you. We're looking at a graph. The very top, there's your resting membrane potential. We're at negative 70, right? And there is the stimulus, and I see a little bump upward. All right, it's an excitatory local blip. We could also call it an EPSP, right? So it's excitatory, and what is it doing? It's bringing the resting membrane potential closer toward threshold. If instead the stimulus caused a downward movement. We would say that the cell is becoming more hyperpolarized, making it more difficult to reach threshold. What sorts of molecules are re released to cause EPSPs? My point is, when a neurotransmitter causes a sodium gate to open, that's usually going to be an excitatory response, right? Le causing the cell to become more positive. If instead the neurotransmitter, like GABA, opens up chlorine channels, what's it going to do? Drive that cell more negative and make it less likely to reach threshold. Carl. What actually causes when a neuron is actually A local disturbance? And is that disturbance, and now we're talking about a second neuron, right? So we're talking about an EPSP or an IPSP, a second postsynaptic neuron response. So there was a neuron just before that did what? If it's getting an IPSP signal, the neuron before released something like GABA that caused chlorine channels to open, which made that second neuron less likely to fire. Okay. So this is neuron to neuron, and these, this is the second neuron in the sequence. This is the postsynaptic neuron. And either there have been some GABA-like uh, neurotransmitter released that would cause an IPSP, or there were excitatory neurons coming down that caused an EPSP.
cute little video to watch. Now, you've all been, some of you have been alluding to this. You've been asking this question now for two days, and I've been telling you to hold off, hold off, Josh, hold off. Now, what happens when a bunch of signals come in at the same time? That neuron has to integrate all of those signals. We're going to use the word summation, right, to sum, to bring, to add all together all of the incoming signals. We're going to add in the inhibitory signals with the excitatory signals. Remember, one neuron can receive thousands of signals simultaneously, and it has to figure out what to do with them. Some of them, again, are EPSPs. Some of those signals will be IPSPs. The neuron now has to decide, right, what's the, over, what's the overwhelming signal coming in. This is democracy, right? One vote wins the presidency. If one vote over makes that neuron more excitatory than inhibitory, then whoop, off we go, or no, we don't. Right? So this is just democracy when you think about summation of all these signals coming in. So you're simply going to, as the word suggests, sum is to add. Right? Add up all of the incoming signals. And where does this summation, where's the calculator, if you will? At the axon hillock. Where do these signals have to get to be added together or subtracted? They've got to reach the axon hillock. That's where the calculator is. That's where the adding and subtracting is going to occur. And if there's enough excitatory signal, whoop, hit threshold, off we go. If most of the signals coming in are pulling us down below threshold, then the action potential will not fire. Yes? That's making sense? So again, it's this balance between EPSPs and IPSPs. Now, there's two ways that we have to think about these signals coming in to the soma. There's going to be temporal summation and spatial summation. Picture with me for a moment a neuron. It's got 10 dendrites. What do you think temporal summation is referring to versus spatial? Temporal summation. A single synapse generates EPSP so quickly that you start adding up those signals over time, causing threshold. Temporal, time. Things are coming down the axon so quickly, right, or down the dendrite so quickly that you're getting signals just bouncing off the back of each other. Do, 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 do. And it's happening so, so fast time-wise, temporal summation, that they become additive. Versus spatial summation. You've got EPSPs coming in from several dendrites simultaneously, coming in from several den dendrites from different places, from different spaces, spatial summation. And once again, they will be added at the axon hillock. So again, you're going to have many synapses adding up together this potential, this local potential, causing the cell to reach threshold and fire an action potential. Let me show you a picture of these and try to make sense of this. So on the top, this is temporal summation. This is your, for the purpose of this diagram, this is the soma. And look what's, there's three axons communicating with this soma. And one of them, the one in the middle, is sending very frequent signals. Those lines represent another action potential. And those action potentials are coming in to this neuron, this post-synaptic neuron, causing repeated rapid EPSPs, excitatory signals. What's the cell going to do with those? It's going to sense all those rapidly coming in signals as a large excitatory signal and will cause the action potential to go versus spatial summation. I've got, again, my three neurons speaking three presynaptic neurons speaking to my one 
postsynaptic neuron, and each one is firing not very rapidly, but they're all firing at a nice little pace. But again, what's the neuron going to do? It's going to take all of these signals coming in from different spaces, different places, and add them all together to cause an action potential. So again, it's all about temporal timing or space, spatial, all these collective signals coming in to the neuron. That's what's considered summation. So when you think about those EPSPs coming in rapidly one after another, look at this graph. <coughs> what do we see on the left-hand side? Negative 70, resting membrane potential. And here's a stimulus, another stimulus, another stimulus. They're coming in so rapidly that it actually, the, the neuron never gets to get back down to what? It never gets to kind of relax. And those constant rapid EPSPs are driving that overall membrane potential up toward threshold. And once we hit threshold, once again, of course, depolarizing, repolarizing action potential. Now, do you think that's a better picture to appreciate temporal or spatial summation? Temporal, because what's happening? We're coming in really, really rapidly, and as a result, right, we're, we're adding these together and hitting threshold. Now, what would spatial perhaps look like differently? Yeah, they're all going together. There's a lot of signals coming in, and simultaneously, they're all pushing it to, th to threshold at once. So you wouldn't see this little stair step. The stair step tells you that it's more than likely temporal, coming in in rapid fire. The spatial would be lots of them coming in at once, and there would be this one big push up toward threshold. So more like a straight line? Um, I, I would guess that if there was going to be a, a picture of spatial, that you would just see a straight line, right? Just a, let me go back, get this to work. You would have more of just a straight line, not this rapid increase that looks like it's being push, 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 but instead all of a bunch of signals coming in and driving it straight up to threshold. So that's summation, right? Adding the signals or subtracting the signals, adding them together. EPSPs and IPSPs coming together for integration. What, therefore, is this other term, facilitation? If you have a facilitator in your life, you have someone who does what? Helps you, makes things happen, right? And hopefully you don't have too many inhibitors in your life. All right, we've all got facilitators, people who work with us to make things happen for us versus inhibitors. So facilitation is when one neuron enhances the effect of another. One neuron helps another neuron do its job to be more efficient. And you can have many neurons facilitating the firing of another neuron. Now, for the first time, I want you to think about where are the three places that a synapse can occur? And a, a, a synaptic knob can come in and make contact with a dendrite, axodendritic. It can come in and make direct contact with a soma, axosomatic. And because there's no myelin there, an axon can come in and directly connect to another axon terminus at the very end where there aren't any Schwann cells. That's what's happening here. Let me get your orientation here. This is an axon terminus. This is an axon terminus. We are making a synapse between two synaptic knobs, basically. Okay? Now, this is the primary one. So there's an action potential coming down this axon, and we would expect that as that signal comes down, that neurotransmitters would be released from the synaptic knob. But oh, wait a second. There's another neuron that's coming in. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, this is an inhibitory neuron. And right now, this inhibitory neuron is quiet. It's not doing anything. There's nothing being released here. And so, what we would expect happens. The signal comes down. It's an excitatory signal. And as a result, neurotransmitters are released. 
causing an EPSP on the next neuron. However, it's possible for this neuron, which is just sitting there, to release inhibitory neurotransmitters. Therefore, what's it going to cause right here? IPSPs. And those IPSPs could do what? Outweigh any excitatory signals coming down the axon. And as a result, they would negate each other, if you will, sum them all together, and as a result, there would be no signal release at all. There wouldn't even be a release of neurotransmitters here. Because hold on, I want you to think about one more thing. This axon, let me tell the whole story, then you can ask questions. How many different kinds of neurotransmitters can this one neuron release? One, right? A neuron does not release multiple neurotransmitters. A cholinergic neuron releases only acetylcholine. An adrenergic neuron only releases norepinephrine. A GABAergic neuron only releases GABA. So every neuron can only release one type of neurotransmitter, which only can have one effect on the next cell, right? Either excitatory or inhibitory. So here, whatever this would have been, this would have been an excitatory neurotransmitter, right? But it has been negated by the release of a negative inhibitory signal from this neighboring neuron. We would say that this is facilitation, but that, actually this facilitation is a negative facilitation. This is an inhibition. So now we see that the, the nervous system is not just axons talking to dendrites or axons talking to somas, causing one cell to be excited or inhibited and then causing an action potential down to the end. But we can actually influence synapses at the actual synaptic knob by having these facilitating or inhibiting neurons coming in. Remember I said before, the reason we have so many synapses is to allow us to have what? More control. So now we're beginning to see some of this control. We can not only just send action potentials, but we can actually control. Facilitate would actually do what? What do you think of facilitating would do? Yeah, it would help, right? So in this, in this, I know I've got 30 seconds. In this situation, what do I have? This, I've, I already said it, but here it is in words. This guy right here is releasing GABA. We know GABA is inhibitory. So it shut this down. But what if instead there was another neuron right next to it that was releasing an excitatory? It would have the ability of doing what? Pushing up or increasing the opportunity for an EPSP. So, a, neuron only a neuron only releases one neurotransmitter. Well, there's hundreds of them, but it only can release one type. Okay? Only, every neuron can only release one type of neurotransmitter. That's its job. It doesn't have the ability of releasing one neurotransmitter or another neurotransmitter, depending upon the day or the situation. Every neuron only is made and created to release one type of neurotransmitter within the nervous system. We've got just a few more slides to continue on in this chapter. This has been a big chapter. Chapter 14, where we're going next, is not very long. So we'll definitely be able to finish up 12 and get going into 14. And then we will also get into some 16 uh, before the first exam.